and they all sang the Internationale. They all sang the Internationale. Katerina Yakov saw red flags flapping in the breeze above the Russian tanks as she fell upon her knees. And so many different voices in so many different tongues sang the most beautiful song that could ever have been sung. In German, Lithuanian, in Polish, and in Dutch, a myriad of melodies as never had been such. In Russian and in Yiddish, Italian and French emerged from the forest beneath the trench. When the sun rose the next morning, it was the first of May, and they all sang the Internationale. When the sun rose the next morning, it was the first of May, and they all sang the Internationale. They all sang the Internationale. Völkert, die Signale, auf zum letzten Gefecht. Die Internationale, er kämpft das Menschenrecht. Völkert, die Signale, auf zum letzten Gefecht. Die Internationale, er kämpft das Menschenrecht. David, thank you. Thank you. It's just beautiful, moving, touching. We light this candle. As we do every Sunday to start our meeting. think about those departed from us and think about solidarity all around the world. And I maybe I read or maybe I sing, maybe I make up a, a song out of these words from our founder, uh, Clarence Skinner. Out of the world's wide ways we come to this, our house of fellowship and aspiration. Here may the evils which beset us be banished by the power of justice, the fears that haunt us be overcome by fresh insight, the doubts that drive us be dissolved into finer faith. Here each in our own way, yet together let us for a brief time look into the mysteries of life's beginning, the source out of which the endless eons roll and countless lives emerge, and with renewed hope search through this maddening maze of things to find again life's aims and meaning and above all, it's glory. Clarence Skinner, one of our founders. So good morning, everybody. Um, we have uh, Charlie Welch to, to uh, welcome and uh, to uh, acknowledge his beautiful May Day backdrop of, of Che. And, and we have a bunch of things in our own backdrop, um, which we want to point out, first of all, is one of our board members, Ed Pazanese, who's joining us physically, which um, you are welcome to as well now as we sort of um, slouch back towards Copley Square and and uh, come and, and be here again once we are uh, uh, okay with that and we've been vaccinated and we feel safe uh, in each other's company. We have all the PPE you need, masks and, and uh, sanitizer, if, if that, is, that helps. Uh, we also have uh, a wealth of pupusas in, in, the, in the refrigerator upstairs that can beautifully be reheated and made for a delicious lunch. Uh, eventually, Luis Guzman will join us again and we will try to uh, take up where we left off about a year and a couple of months ago. Um, so that's just a, a welcome to our our auditorium where we're broadcasting from. It's kind of a mess right now. I'll tell you that an amazing thing has finally started. That is the installation of our um, air source heat pumps, which will be our new heating and air conditioning system for the entire building. We have a crew of really uh, wonderful 
um, uh, skilled HVAC technicians who are doing these installations. It involves outdoor units up on the roof, and it involves uh, lines that connect the outdoor units with indoor units that are called cassettes or uh, mini splits. And these, uh, these lines carry uh, refrigerant, power, and, um, and condensate out. So it's, it's a pretty complicated thing, but it's just a, a wonderful first step in our uh, um, attempt and our intent to make this a state-of-the-art energy efficient building for the, the, the city of Boston and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. That's a lofty goal, especially if you don't have any money to do it with, uh, but we're, we're taking the first steps and we have some really solid um, help in doing this. We, we're uh, in the first steps of looking into a, a grant from the city of Boston, something called Community Pre Preservation Act grant. Um, and we have some very um, wonderful Boston, or Copley Square and Back Bay activists who are helping us with this, people who are pretty well connected with the city of Boston. Uh, Jacqueline Royce is the, is, is the one that I wanna mention uh, who, who just is really, she's 85 years old and a force of nature. She's just pushing us. I know you can do this. You have to fill out these forms and oh, you don't have that part yet? That's no problem. I know the people at the CEO, <laughs> it's really just amazing. Thank you, Jacqueline Royce, if you are joining us. She's not a member, uh, she's very uh, fastidious member of, of, of uh, a, a Jewish congregation that meets uh, at um, Emmanuel Church, but she has been just a, a really wonderful force in, in pushing me and, and this board to, to uh, move forward on getting this funding for further um, improvements of our, our building to make it a, a more energy efficient building. Um, I want to tell you a couple more things. Um, behind me is the Sacco Vanzetti plaque. Uh, crafted by Gutzon Borglum in 1928, soon after they were um, uh, assassinated, um, executed by, the, by the, the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. That's a plaque that has been uh, in, our, in our building for uh, about 50 years now. Um, and it's, it's quite a story how it got here. But um, Bob Dattilio, who was, uh, who was uh, probably the eminent Sacco and Vanzetti scholar, who passed away just a few months ago, and we have um, sort of part of his legacy as part of Community Church's legacy because of our connection with the Sacco and Vanzetti case and the early 1920s um, activism that we did. Um, uh, we have that connection and there is, after his passing, a, a whole new incentive to make another copy of that plaque and display it in a public place in the city of Boston, most, most logically in the North End where the Italian community is most located. Um, we will have a meeting tomorrow night. Uh, uh, on, it's an online meeting that will include not only Community Church of Boston, board members, uh, please join us and anyone else who wants to join us, uh, I will give you the link, please be in touch. Um, and it's, it's, it's a question and answer uh, with the, uh, the Community Church, Sacco and Vanzetti uh, Commemoration Society and a new organization that is called, um, uh, oh boy, I'm not remembering exactly their name, but uh, they're, they're a new committee that, that is, is really intent on moving this idea forward of a, um, a, a public uh, commemoration of putting Sacco and Vanzetti in the, uh, in the forefront of Boston's, Boston's history. Um, and we will have this meeting. It will be a, a question and answer information gathering session about the ideas behind doing this. And what it involves is taking this plaque down and sending it to a foundry to make a rubber mold of, of the plaque. Um, so there will be a lot of questions. If you want to join us, please be in touch either, either through the church email or my own personal email, and I will send you the link to tomorrow night, 7 p.m.'s meeting. We'll probably be joined by Judge Peter Agnes, who is a retired judge from the, uh, the Su Supreme Judicial Court, and uh, hopefully by uh, 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 former Governor Michael Dukakis, who will uh, um, 
we're hoping will join us as well because he's been also a, a long, long ag advocate for their exoneration and for their, their also being um, in a public place. A um, little bit of news about one, uh, one member of, of the church. His name is Greg Brown. Not the musician Greg Brown, but the uh, the uh, wonderful retired Trinidadian um, a diesel mechanic who has been a longtime fastidious member. His uh, his habit was to go to Trinidad uh, during the winters. Uh, in 2020, he went to Trinidad for the winter, and he was no longer able to come back because of the the, the flights and and the COVID issue. Uh, but I, I have spoken to him on the phone, and uh, he's he's doing okay with his uh, with his not being able to come back to his house. His daughter lives here in in uh, south of Boston, uh, but he sends his greetings, and I really have enjoyed talking to him a couple of times on the phone. If um, some of you. If some of you want to uh, call Greg Brown, I, again, I have his phone number and I can, I can relate it to you. Um, Crystal Jackson and I, Crystal is our, our uh, office manager and uh, wonderful gifted publications manager, have finally gotten a system together, together of sending thank yous to people who have sent donations to our, our work. Um, if you in the past months have not received a thank you in the manner in which you are accustomed from uh, a, a, any standard kind of nonprofit, I apologize. It's, it's all my fault. But we think we have a system for, for getting thank yous to you for every time that you send us a donation. And there'll be more about that later because we have a collection plate and we do it later on in the program. So um, uh, thank you. Uh, here's a generic thank you to all of you who have sent uh, donations uh, and, and especially to those of you who send regular donations and especially to those back bay um, neighborhood association people who have sent pretty sizable donations to help with this heat pump uh, project. Finally, we have a, a kind of a mess in the auditorium right now, but it's slowly getting cleaned up for when we're back together again. We had uh, on tables um, 50 years worth of cassettes uh, of recordings of community church programs and it is really quite a wealth of of presentations and we um, chronologize them and we put them in archival boxes and we're hoping to go into a, a, a systematic process of digitizing and making public some of the uh, starting with the uh, you call it a triage but it's um, the, 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 the most important ones is, you know, the likes of Cesar Chavez or Rosa Parks or, or, um, or many by Howard Zinn, who spoke here very regularly, and, and, and many by Noam Chomsky. So um, that's, that's the next task after they've been um, organized and uh, put in boxes and they're back up in our archive room, um, uh, which is a, a marvelous thing. And, and disorganized thing to behold, believe me. Um, so I want to thank uh, Ron Elbert, who has been very helpful in that in that little task of of organizing all of these cassettes. Um, so there you have a little bit of community church news. And again, I I hope you're able to 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 come down here sometime soon. Um, uh, and and we'll make this building uh, alive again. Um, we also have the task of, of um, deciding uh, a lot of space use decisions about the top floors, which will be in, in mid-summer and into the fall vacated by our longtime beloved, beloved tenant, the theater offensive. Um, and we have to decide whether to take on a new tenant it has to be exactly the right tenant like theater offensive was or whether to take over this building ourselves and make it a five story church with different stuff on every single level, which is a, a, um, a beautiful possibility, but I don't know if we can afford it and um, and uh, that's the task of somebody above my pay grade, believe me, <laughs> which is not much of a pay grade. Anyway, David, thank you.
so good to have you here. And I hope that we can have you again here soon. Um, I've got to find, where is that big, huge post? Oh, I'm going to go get it. Oh, oh that's a great Oh, look at that. <laughs> From the pre-pandemic years. Yeah, we'll, we'll get a good copy of one of those and frame it to, to be somewhere. It, it's just a, an expression of how in high regard we hold you and your activism and your, your musicianship and your prolific songwriting is just so phenomenal. Thank you, David, for being with us. The floor is yours. Well, thank you, theme. It's great to be back at always, although I much prefer visiting the church in person and seeing that wonderful plaque. And, um, you know, since the, you know, long after the deaths of uh, Sacco and Vanzetti, it was, um, became, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, uh, this people involved with their defense were trying to be uh, quiet about at the time in order to hopefully uh, you know, avoid their execution by the state of Massachusetts. But they were good friends of uh, Luigi Galliani, who was the publisher of uh, of uh, anarchist uh, Italian newspaper called Chronicles of Subversion. And um, many people would call them Gallianists, in fact. But um, no, but Galli people, followers of Galliani didn't actually use the term Gallianists. That was just people who called them that. But... If the Gallianists had not been uh, driven underground and made illegal by the, by the national laws passed around that time, 1920, 21, by the uh, Insurrection Acts and, and the Alien and Sedition Acts and all those other acts that criminalized Eastern and Southern Europeans and criminalized anarchism and criminalized a lot of other um, political perspectives, you know, the city of Boston would be such a different, different place today. Uh, it would be affordable to live in if it were run by anarchists instead of capitalists. I think the idea of, of, of the city of Boston honoring Sacco and Vanzetti is about as reasonable as the city of Philadelphia apologizing for the move bombing. You know, they can stop, stop creating the problem by running the city the way they do. It's fucking capitalists. I hate the people that run the city of Boston and Philadelphia, I must say. Well, and uh, I'll... <laughs> <laughs> let me let me let me tell you something that we have a, a city council now that is almost all women and and women of color primarily i know i've heard about that maybe they'll be able to change the laws slate of candidates that's a bunch of women of color and it's it's a beautiful thing and maybe we're going in the right direction yeah very recently very recent new very developments recent. yeah the, the 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 vice mayor and stuff you know and of course in the city of boston uh, the reason everything is so expensive is because it was on a statewide level that they got rid of rent control i was there at the time i saw the exodus of families leaving uh, somerville and leaving mattapan and le leaving everywhere and um, uh, ethnic cleansing this is a this is a song uh, about uh, somebody who just died of COVID nineteen. It's a good time for memorials at church. Dreamed I saw in Feeney, it was on a picket line. Somewhere in the world where the workers did combine, cheering on the strikers with a guitar in her hand from Oregon to Ireland. I dreamed I saw in Feeney amid the foggy glow of the flashbang grenades outside the WTO, singing songs against the war at a military fort or making arguments in court. I dreamed I saw in Feeney amid the fog. Uh, I dreamed I saw in Feeney in the Texas hills singing songs around a torch at Kerrville crossing every bridge she could with the wheels of a car with some CDs in the trunk along with a guitar 
I dreamed I saw Anthony. I dreamed she never fell. She was in Baja with her grandkids doing swell. Sharing free advice on how to find the cheapest flight so you can be throwing Swedish snowballs beneath the northern lights. I dreamed I saw Anne Feeney get her first dose of vaccine instead of reading of the people who died of COVID-19. In the New York Times, nice things that they said, but I so much wish we could have, and here still instead. I dreamed I saw Anne Feeney. We miss her, don't we? Yeah. And Fini Presente. Presente. You all can see a beautiful remembrance of, of Anne. Maybe some of you attended. Um, it's, it's recorded online in several places. I've seen it. We remember you, Anne. Um, this set of three books came. It's called Murder Incorporated. Uh, Dreaming of Empire is the book one. America's favorite pastime with a bunch of uh, bombs dropping from planes is book two. And Perfecting Tyranny is book three. These are by Mumia Abu Jamal and Stephen Vittoria. Um, beautiful addition to our library. And we think of, of Mumia having just had heart surgery, and we send our thoughts out to you or to his family who, um, and best wishes for, for a, a smooth recovery if it's possible inside a horrific prison system. Um, another book I want to point out is someone I want to speak at Community Church. Her name is Carolyn Crockett. And it's called People Before Highways. And this is an account of, of what Boston did, uh, Boston activists did uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, which was shut down a huge highway project that was going to cut into the heart of Boston. And um, I, I think of the likes of Mel King, and Chuck Turner, and the likes of someone who figures largely into today's presentation, and that is Femke Rosenbaum, who started Spontaneous Celebrations and who uh, was just uh, also involved in that move to shut down that horrible highway project and replace it with what is now the Southwest Corridor that has a train line and that has parks and, and gardens and, um, and uh, skate parks and all kinds of other uh, wonderful things on each bike path on either side of, of the orange line. So I just mentioned that book to, to, to shout out to Femke Rosenbaum because of, of her role in these images that we're gonna see today. Finally, I wanna just make a quick one. This is, this is um, Eduardo Galeano and I read from him a lot. It's called Children of the Days. It's, it's a day book. It has an entry for each day. And I'm going to read the May Day entry, not May 2, but May 1. May 2 is actually pretty good, too. But I, I, I don't want to cut off of, from Judith's uh, time. Um, this is what it says. International Workers Day, the technology of shared flight. The first goose to take off opens the way for the next who clears the path for the third and the strength of the third raises the fourth, who then helps the fifth. And the impulse of the fifth pulls along the sixth who offers wind to the seventh. When the lead goose tires, he goes to the back of the line and leaves his spot to another who moves to the apex of the V, the geese form in the air. Each takes a turn forward and back and none of them believes he is super goose because he flies first or that flying last makes him a loser. That's the entry from Eduardo Galeano, Children of the Days. And it speaks to our purpose at Community Church, the cooperative principle. 
Judith Woodruff is our beloved board member. Judith and David have been board members for a couple of years. And uh, although they sometimes in, in the years of community church have not been too visible, they have been members and they raised their kids in this church all the way back into the late 70s, early 80s. And it's a pleasure that they're with us as board members. And um, it's all a special pleasure that Judith has this presentation out of several uh, that she has um, suggested. Um, and this one is about May Day and it's called The Red and Green of May Day. I don't near, need to, um, to uh, introduce Judith, um, although I probably should, but I don't have her bio in front of me. I just want to hand it over to Judith and David and thank David, especially because of his work in putting this PowerPoint together and their joint work in helping making this weird thing called community church run and run smoothly. Unmute Judith. All you have to do is unmute. I got it. I got there it. There you go. Okay. Take it away. Okay. Well, I'm uh, going to start with giving you a background of uh, May Day. Many of you know it, but it always helps to uh, talk about it and commemorate it on, on this is May. Uh, this is right around May Day. So that's one thing. And then the second thing is we're going to treat you to see some of the murals or most of the murals that I could photograph. Um, that you would see if you that Wake Up the Earth Festival that was started by Femke Rosenbaum, who uh, Dean alluded to, who's a community activist and force of, of power in nature um, in the Jamaica Plain community. And uh, she started this festival and was joined by a lot of community activists. And uh, we were able to commission uh, artists to put it into um, mural boards four feet by eight feet that are displayed on the Wake of the Earth Festival, uh, usually on the first Saturday of May. Well, COVID has put a, a dent in that, but you can see them online and you can see them here. So that's gonna be nice. I'm promising them as a reward for listening to me right afterward. So stay tuned during my speech um, about the history of May Day um, in America and well, it's celebrated in the world, but I'm gonna mainly deal about how it started. And then right after that, there's gonna be um, those beautiful murals made by community artists and also by community. So um, you can see them and hopefully next year, we can see them at their usual place at the Stony Brook Park. And you can join in on the Wake Up the Earth Parade also at 11 o'clock, usually at the monument in JP. So after that commercial, I'm going to begin explaining the history now. So for which I need to put on my glasses. Okay, well, May Day is an ancient holiday. And um, even in the times of the Greeks and the Romans, uh, there, were, there were many special days that, uh, that they were dedicated uh, to an appreciation of working people, believe it or not. I mean, that's not something you read about in the history books, but um, in our country, the 4th of July actually was a Labor Day. I didn't know that until I did a little research on this talk. I had no idea that it was considered Labor Day because in 1790, uh, the first union of shoemakers, carpenters, printers, and all kinds of crafts people um, decided to designate the 4th of July as their uh, working holiday to assert workers' rights. And in fact, it was in, up until the 1820s and 30s that the 4th of July was considered Labor Day. I, I didn't know that, but maybe you didn't either, and that's exciting to know. Anyway, uh, Labor Day and May 1st um, began to overshadow the celebration of um, the original May Day. And in 1834, a bill was passed by Congress who signed it to make Labor Day an official holiday. So Labor Day was an official holiday since um, that time. But the struggle for the shorter work day, people were working 10, 12, 15, even 15 hours a week early in our nation's struggle. And so the, of course it was necessary to begin a struggle for the shorter work day. And uh, they were demanding at that time what was what they thought was an improvement was the 10 hour work day. Um, and that began about the time with the craft unions 
which were popular in Europe and had been there for over a thousand years, were now uh, starting in the late 1790s in our country. And in 1791 in Philadelphia, the carpenters went on strike and it was the first strike for the 10 hour day. And uh, they wanted time also for additional pay when they worked overtime. And I couldn't find any information on that strike, but there was a strike following that in 1827. And guess where it was? It was in Boston. There's something to know about us. And uh, it also was in Philadelphia. And I quote, they wrote, all men have a right, a just right derived from their creator, creator to have sufficient time in each day for the cultivation of their minds so they can have self-improvement. Un unfortunately, these uh, first strikes failed, but that didn't stop the struggles from continuing. And right here in Boston, in 1835, workers put out a circular um, that urged workers to work together to get the 10 hour day. Um, do I notice that I see Ed and not me? It's okay. Okay, well, you hear me. Okay, good. Okay, they wrote, we too long have been subjected to a cruel, odious, and just and tyrannical system, which compels us to exhaust our physical and mental powers. We have rights, we have duties as American citizens. And as um, we're members of society, which forbid us to uh, dispose of our free time, um, when we only demand now just 10 hours of work a day. That circular passed around in Philadelphia during a general strike. That was in 1835 that the general strike in America started. And that strike helped to change the working day from sometimes 12 and 15 hours to the advanced state of 10 hours. And um, that, you know, that, that was in coal mining and that strike was very important. It had, uh, it put much fear into the heart of the owners who were frightened. God knows what would come next. <laughs> they, they were very frightened. And so um, it, they couldn't stop it though. Other strikes in other, in other cities followed. So by 1835, most of the country worked an average of 10 hours a day, which they thought was a great improvement and a great victory. <coughs> Excuse me. However, a depression followed, as it often does in cycles. And a few years, a few years later, because of that, people had to work for whatever was put out there for them, and it erased the gains. So they had to struggle all over again. I'm sorry to get some water here. Okay, so that movement was spearheaded right here in New England by the New England Workmen's Association. And I want you to know that women played a very important role in that. They were textile workers and they uh, formed the first union here in Lowell, Massachusetts. We should be very proud of factory workers in the whole United States. And it was organized in 1835. So Massachusetts has that history of women textile workers organizing to be very, very proud of. But that victory, unfortunately, as many victories for workers was short lived and employers had joined together and they insisted that workers sign a contract before they could be employed that promised that they would um, not protest if the bosses called for more than 10 hours. No, no protest. And <clears throat> workers, if they refused to sign that they wouldn't protest if they were being asked to work 15 hours a day, then they would be blackmailed and their names would go out to all the other employers in the nation so that they wouldn't be hired as uh, as nuisances to the bosses. And um, <clears throat> so working conditions were not great for workers, but in 19, 1860, uh, most of them were still able to achieve working at least 10 hours. That was the standard work day, it was not an eight hour day, it was a 10 hour day. And uh, this was a victory of sort because originally the factories had demanded that people work 10 and 11 hours a day. Um, by 1866, there were labor organizations all over the country. And Karl Marx wrote, quote, out of the death of the Civil War, the first fruit was the eight hour day agitation. And uh, this was backed up in Europe, by the way, by the first workers international. There were many internationals, but, 
but the whole organization by workers in the United States stimulated the First World Workers International. Now, um, there was a labor leader that emerged and he was from Boston, by the way. So we can have a very, I don't know if people in Boston know they have a pretty good labor history here. And his name was uh, Ira Stewart and he was a member of the Machinists and the Blacksmiths Union. And he was against trying uh, uh, to get a shorter day uh, just by labor agitation. He thought there should be a national eight hour day law all across the country, all across the nation, it should be the regular law. And they shouldn't be different laws in different states and different cities and whatever. Uh, these campaigns brought about some kinds of success and they were petitions sent to Congress. And uh, by 1868, there was a law passed by the Congress that said there should be an eight hour day. Did you know that? I didn't know that. So it was actually a law and um, but it was only, by the way, for those who work for the federal government, not all over the United States. And they turned out even to be empty promises for them because when the laws were passed, the governors of some various states, in fact, most states refused to um, make sure that they were followed. And they felt, in fact, when they could do it, they added many loopholes so that they were meaningless. So during the depression, which often happens in this country periodically, there was one that lasted quite a while from uh, 1873 to 1879. And the employers thought, okay, this is the time to lengthen the working day. So there were worker demonstrations, but they were not successful because uh, people were so desperate for work, they, they just couldn't sort of stay out on strike. And um, they also, bosses were very clever. They used one immigrant group to fight against another so that it was very difficult for them to get worker unity at that time. But then there was an organization that came and said, okay, let's, let's see if we can get some worker victories here. And that was, as you may have learned in school, the Knights of Labor. And it had a membership it got over at a time when there wasn't that many, many less people in this country. They got over 700,000 workers to join them. And they tried to win over the legislators. They didn't really want to become agitators. They said, look, we don't want to fight you in the streets. Why don't you just go and pass laws to protect us? And uh, they asked, and they would go and meet with Congress people and try to get their legislators to pass legislation uh, that they was going to help them. Do you think the legislators did it? No, <laughs> they didn't. So the workers started a slogan. An injury to one is an injury to all. And that, that's a slogan that stays with us today. I'll repeat it. An injury to one is an injury to all. That was the slogan of the day and it still works for today. So the first significant organizational steps that were taken by United States labor to secure the eight hour day occurred during the Civil War in 1863. I don't think I've ever learned about that before I did this research. I only learned about the Civil War and not that this first organizational steps for unions was started during the Civil War. And who started it? Well, it was the machinists and the blacksmiths union that endorsed an eight hour day and then guess who? We have to be very proud. It was the Boston Trades Association that took the next step and took a stimulus end and started the biggest lobbying campaign for the eight hour, uh, for the, for the eight hour day. And so in 1866, there were more than eight hour, let's see, there were huge eight hour day demonstrations across the nation. And there was a lot of agitation, which I never read about when I was learning about the Civil War. And out of all of this, there was a Boston machinist. His name was Iris Stewart. And he was from Boston and felt that the agreements with the local employers was not a great solution uh, for the whole mass of workers that, you know, just doing it individually because those people who weren't able to organize in their particular cities or states, they wouldn't be affected. And he wanted a national law. He wanted a national law to make sure that capitals were gonna be required to make a shorter work week and that he wanted laws that would regulate their working conditions. So that started the International Workmen's Association. It was known as the first international. You may have heard of these internationals, but this was the first international. And what was his cry? Eight hour day, that was its rallying cry. So 25 years later, 
The second international started, and what was their rallying cry? The eight hour day. They just hadn't achieved it the first time. It's gonna take a lot more work. So the platform had to be joined by the whole world in creating what eventually became May Day through their agitation, which I'm gonna tell you about. So they started out by not agitating. They started a petition and they got 10,000 signatures, which was a lot in those times. And they submitted it to Congress and asked them to pass the eight hour day. And you know what? Congress passed the eight hour day. And uh, they said all federal employees, not all workers, but all federal employees should only work eight hours. But the laws were empty because the governors of the state had to enforce them. And you think they did? Of course not, they didn't. So they were on the books, but they were all full of loopholes even when they were passed. And this emboldened the employers. They felt, oh, well, you know, now there's a depression. It's 1873. And they uh, thought, this is the time to lengthen the workday. This is the moment that they're going to be desperate and we have something to offer. The workers protested, but you know, the demonstrations weren't successful. They were able to pit sometimes different immigrant groups against another. They give it one immigrant group a few more cents than another. And they was, you know, try to stir up conflict, which unfortunately worked. And the working hours remained over 10 days, 10 hours long. That was the standard working day. But in many factories, there was no one to enforce the fact that it was 12 or 15 hours. So the Knights Constitution, the Knights of Labor, demanded the uh, eight hour day, but they, they were somehow wanted to not be too, too uh, radical. And they thought maybe if they were less radical, everyone would be so pleased they would just give them what they wanted. So um, at that point, um, uh, they were, the workers became very discouraged by the lack of progress. They, they saw the Knights trying to cooperate too much with the um, legislators, hoping that by being such good workers, they would be rewarded and be given what they needed instead of having to take it, but it didn't work. And so they, um, unions began to decide, we need mass demonstrations here. We need to, to show that we have some strength. So on May 1st, which possibly is a reason that we have May 1st as our holiday, um, 44 unions started to cooperate. And you know, that wasn't easy. They often were being pitted against each other. Oh, he's getting more, or he's Italian, whatever. And uh, they were able to organize a massive uh, parade. They had 10,000 marches and there were strikes all across the industries and especially guess where in the city of Chicago. And this action, that happened on May 1st, influenced the choice of May 1st so that that became the new time to demonstrate for the eight hour day. And the Knights of Labor was headed by a man, his name was Powerly. He was a person who thought that by being, showing that you weren't really gonna be too agitated, that that would work. He was very anti-strike. He thought that that would make the legislators angry and that they wouldn't give him what they wanted, but by being calm and reasonable that they would. But of course it didn't work. And he said, you know what we should do? Believe it or not, this is what he called for. Every worker should write an essay on the working day and then release them on Washington's birthday on 1885. And that way by scattering these beautiful things that they had written among the public, um, everybody would understand. <laughs> Can you believe that's what he actually, well, nobody paid attention to him. And uh, he kept trying to oppose a strike. Eventually the workers didn't listen to him and they passed a resolution asking for national, the national leadership to order a strike for the eight hour day. And in fact, they asked that a declaration be made to this effect and they started to organize mass meetings. They put out circulars and they started to use all kinds of means to get people in the mindset that they may have to take a mass action. So one of the leaflets they was put out ended with a call for, quote, a day of protest against oppression, against the tyranny, against ignorance and the war of any kind. It's a day on which to enjoy eight hours, eight hours for rest and eight hours for what you will. That's been made into a song, of course, and very big slogan. Anyway, this circular uh, said that on 
May 1st, 1886, they would be the, a Labor Day. And they said this would be sanctioned by the state, by the city, and by the governments. And um, they, they called it. Now, Powerly, instead of trying to help organize this, what the workers themselves called for, actually tried to stop it. <laughs> Can you believe that? Their leader tried to stop it. And he, but he was powerless. When they found out that their leaders were working against them, the workers began to prepare for the May 1st demonstration all the more. So in 1880, a group that moved away and succeeded from the Socialist Labor Party at the time, formed an organization called the Social Revolutionary Club. And it sprang up in many cities, including our city of Boston, and also Chicago, Philadelphia, Milwaukee, etc. And most of the members were immigrants and they had been experiencing very bitter struggles in the United States. And uh, they were attracted to these ideas. Many of them were anarchist ideas. There was a German fellow, an anarchist named uh, Johann Mass Most, who had arrived in the United States. He had been agitating in England. They expelled him <laughs> and he was able to come here. And he published the Die Freiheit and uh, he became the leader of the anarchists. And uh, they developed in Pittsburgh, which was a big place for uh, coal mining, they developed uh, an association called the International Workers' People's Association. And who should be in it but our Haymarket martyrs, Albert Carson and August Spies. And they were the delegates elected from Chicago. So they already had this beginning of a revolutionary background. August Spies, not Albert. August Spies. August Spies. Did I say Albert? I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. August Spies. Okay. Thank you. Um, most advocated propaganda by deed, uh, a way of trying to create a society without any authority. They were anarchists. There was another wing, what they called the Chicago idea. And they blended a mixture of anarchism and syndalism as a way of dealing with the police and the Pinkerton people who had come to disrupt them and disrupt unions. So there was an 1883 convention in Pittsburgh and um, spies and Parsons uh, sided with most on the futility of uh, political action. Although they didn't believe in trade union work, they felt that they weren't accomplished anything and they were growing frustrated. Um, by staging mass demonstrations and parades and speaking tours, they felt that workers instead of just trying to show that they were so good that they would, would be able to exert much greater influence on their numbers and that they would begin to have more infect and dominate eventually the, uh, uh, the Central Labor Council, uh, the Central Labor Union in Chicago. The Central Labor Union there was a collaboration of 22 unions and they were the seven, among them were the seven largest in the city, so it was powerful. And so they went to them to get help uh, that they would be able during battles with the police to get leadership and assume the fight for this eight hour day, which was not going well enough. So we're getting to put more uh, strong people now in charge. And uh, by April, which was just a few months later, they were very successful. A quarter of a million industrial workers were involved in the movement and um, they organized, again, another 30,000 workers, that's a lot of people, to agitate for the nine or uh, uh, maybe maybe the eight hour day. Uh, there was a lot of anti-labor anti sentiments expressed in newspapers. And even they, in some of the leadership of the unions, they were afraid of this militancy. So there were conservative leaders like the Brotherhood of the Locomotive Engineers who denounced uh, this movement and said, uh, yeah, two hours for work. You know what that means? It's two hours for more loafing about corners, two hours to drink. Who needs that? However, the workers didn't pay any attention to them and they can really continue to organize for the shorter day. And they sang the eight hour song. Maybe later, if you know it, uh, David, you could sing the eight hour song. It starts as they wrote, we mean to take things over. We're tired for toil for naught and bare enough to live on and never an hour for thought. We want to feel the sunshine. We want to smell the flowers. We're sure that God willed it and we mean to take eight hours. 
We're summoning our forces from the shipyard, the shop, and the mill. Eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, and eight hours for what we will. So, as May approached, the Carpenters Union in Boston, do you, we have, Boston has a pretty big labor history, pretty much unknown to many of us. Anyway, they were the ones in Boston that called for a big demonstration at all things Stephaniel Hall. And they said, we're going to prepare for the great event there. And uh, at Daniel Hall, it, they declared, quote, this is the working man's hour. We are going to frighten capital and understand that labor has rights, which it's bound to respect. The hour is at hand when the producer of wealth shall claim his own and freely share in the gains and honors of an advanced civilization. So Boston has a labor history that perhaps many of us don't know. And when May 1st arrived, half a million workers, that's a lot, joined in the eight hour demonstration. There were demonstrations in Massachusetts, Maine, Kansas, Texas, Minnesota, New Jersey, Alabama, cities throughout the United States. However, we have to look at Chicago because it was there that had the most um, eventful March, May 1st. Uh, 30,000 to 40,000 workers went on strike and uh, they were Poles and Germans and Bohemians um, mostly and they marched up Michigan Avenue in Chicago and they made a big demonstration separately on the same day with the lumber workers and uh, they marched through the streets, they had music, they had flags, they had chants, they attracted a lot of people. And the Knights of Labor meat packers began to close down the Chicago stockyards and they won their strike for the eight hour day uh, without a pay reduction. In New York City, 10,000 workers marched down Broadway, went into Union Square and held a big demonstration. And thousands all over, marched all over the United States and what's very interesting is that there was interracial solidarity. Um, more than 6,000 black and white workers were marching together in Louisville, Kentucky. Can you imagine that back, back then? And um, the Louisville parks had been closed to blacks, but instead black and white workers were able to go to the park together and workers with great many nationalities mixed in with them. And there was a giant march of workers of all kinds. What was happening in Boston on that day? Well, on that day, nearly 7,000 carpenters, painters, plumbers also joined the struggle. And they were work struggling for the eight hour day all across the country together. And the capitalists became very scared. And they began to call out police to stop these strikes. And the West well-known strike, of course, that you, all, and all, all, all people guess in the United States learn about is the Haymarket Affair. And that was a confrontation at the McCormick plant. The owners, not caring that they had made an agreement, violated the agreement, thinking the workers would not have the strength to challenge it. And um, they had signed an agreement that they would not punish workers who had gone out on strike, but instead they locked them out. And this lockout brought up on a British strike and it continued from over three years to 18 May, 1886. The factory happened to be located where the lumber shovers union was and there were 10,000 labor shovers, I guess uh, who they were mostly immigrant workers and they were striking for the eight hour day. So 6,000 lumbermen turned out for the rally and uh, joined with the other workers. So it was a big rally and August spies were speaking. Everything was quiet, by the way. There was a peaceful rally. As spies near the end of his speech, the factory bell rang at the McCormick plant nearby. And the, uh, at the end of the day, the people who were strike breakers who had gone in and were hired to replace the workers who were standing outside celebrating the May Day came out. And over 500 of the demonstrators left the rally. They went there to demonstrate against the scabs who were taking their jobs. So as the, um, as that happened, um, the protesters uh, caused the strike breakers to retreat and uh, the police were called and they fired into the crowd and they killed a demonstrator. 
And then later three more demonstrators died from police bullets that were used to put down the demonstration. Many suffered very serious injuries. August Spies saw what happened. So he dashed off a leaflet and he, uh, it was printed in English and German. And he called for a meeting in Haymarket Square to protest this police brutality. The leaflet was distributed. They only were 20,000 printed and uh, announced a protest meeting for uh, half past seven in the evening after work. And uh, the police who saw the leaflet uh, decided that they should suppress this conflict. And there was a storm, unfortunately, a spring storm with a thunderstorm. So the meeting did not draw more than 3,000 workers. Uh, they had expected about 10,000. And it only fitted one end of the Haymarket Square. Uh, Spies was the one who started to address the crowd. He attacked the press for the way they were treating and, and presenting the whole case to the public. And uh, Parsons had just returned from Cincinnati and he didn't know about the Chicago events. So he uh, thought he would talk about socialism, which is what he did when he got up to speak. And then he urged the workers to arm themselves. Uh, but he said, no, we, we have to do this together. We just can't have individual sporadic action. At that very moment that he was speaking about this, a big thunderstorm erupted and um, his Samuel Field, in whose speech was the last, um, saw that most of the workers left the meeting. There were only about 200 left. And the mayor had been called to see how the meeting was going. He saw that it was peaceful. He reported back to the police that they weren't needed and everyone he could go home. So um, the mayor left, the police captain came with police and guess what they were dressed like? They tried to dress like workers <laughs> and they, uh, they, they came and tried to disperse the crowd and they were armed and they marched in the crowd in military fashion dressed as these workers. And um, there were about 180 of them and there were only about maybe equal amount of workers, maybe 200 workers. And Fielden said, you know, this meeting is peaceful, but the police were coming toward the workers stand and suddenly a bomb exploded and it flew through the air and it exploded in front of the police and it killed one instantly, and later it wounded over 70 policemen. And uh, six more policemen died later. And it was from the gunfire that they themselves had fired as they were firing constantly, indiscriminately in the crowd, and the crowd was not armed. Uh, now, Marshall Field and uh, George Pullman and Cyrus McCormick, the big millionaires, millionaires at the time, saw their chance to get rid of these uh, pesty labor organizers. The mayor ordered a dragnet. All workers uh, should be being round up. They arrested hundreds and hundreds of workers, interviewed them, tried to see what was going on with them. And uh, they beat them, they beat the suspects, but they only could indict 31 of them. And in the end, they could only find out eight of them. And among the eight were the Haymarket martyrs. They were uh, Albert Parsons, Samuel Felder, August, August Spies, Michael Schwab, Adolf Fischer, George Engel, Louis Ling, and Oscar Niebe. Uh, predominantly Germans, by the way, German immigrants. So Chicago was the city that made the greatest contribution to the movement for the eight hour day. And it was this leadership, these particular men that were hated by the Chicago employers and they saw their moment. This was the moment they were gonna fix it. The majority of them, of these people who were arrested were not even at the demonstration and all of them had left before the bomb had gone off. That didn't matter. So it's not mentioned that the next day, May 5th, there was a labor reaction to what happened at Haymarket. It was in Milwaukee. Uh, some Polish workers who had been on strike led a protest to close the mill where strike breakers were replacing them. And when they approached the mill, the militia commander who had been called in gave an inaudible shout to stop acting on the orders from the governor who had ordered to suppress it. They claimed they didn't hear it. Um, the crowd continued, said they didn't hear the order. Militia fired into the crowd. They killed eight Polish workers, one German worker. They arrested 50 workers, gave them sentences of nine to 10 months in jail. 
for, they said it was for riot or unlawful assembly. The newspapers praised them for this action, made no objections when it was learned that it was actually revealed that the employers had made cash contributions to the militia companies they called in. I mean, how much more corrupt, even though it was published, there wasn't enough reaction. So there were strikes though. There were several strikes and you can be proud it was in Boston, 7,000 building trade workers walked out, but unfortunately was defeated because the newspapers whipped up anti-immigrant and anti-labor hysteria. And um, the eight hour day movement was not a failure because at least a quarter of a million workers had their hours reduced. They were reduced from 12 hours to nine hours and uh, 10 hours. And also they gained a half holiday. Uh, Saturday used, they used to work. Now they had, were given half of Saturday off. And uh, they eliminated Sunday labor, which had been going on. So the workers uh, didn't get that much, but they gained some things. They gained two hours rest. And uh, now they worked 59 hours instead of 62 hours. At the trial, the defendants were tried for murder not because they were accused of throwing the bomb because they weren't even present. So how could you accuse them to do that? But they did. And the, uh, you know, they, didn't, they weren't present when the police arrived, they had left. But that bomb thrower um, was influenced, they said, by their speeches. So the judge decided that if one was guilty, all of them were guilty. <laughs> that was the kind of justice they had. He allowed the police to show all kinds of bombs and dynamite which frightened the jury. And the judge made insulting remarks about the men all through the trial instead of staying impartial. And uh, the attorney summed it up. Look, anarchy and law is on trial. These men have been selected because they are leaders of men who follow them, you know? And uh, they may be not guilty. They may not be any more guilty than you, but we have to make examples of them nonetheless and convict them. I want you to hang them and then you'll save our society and our institutions. Can you imagine saying that? Because you think that, and know that they weren't present, they weren't guilty, but their ideas were on trial. And that's what made them guilty. And Spies got up and he made an important impassioned speech, which many labor leaders know. And he said, if you think that by hanging us, you're gonna stamp out union movement, huh, then hang us here. And you'll see that you will spark a trend, a spark that flames blaze up and that you will not be able to put out. It may be subterranean now, but you will see you're not gonna be able to put it out later. So that's what he said to them. And uh, he, they appealed, the defense made a very effective appeal, but of course it was turned down because they had decided that they really needed to eliminate these leaders. And there was a lot of rising protests from all over labor, all over the world, in fact. And uh, despite all the pleas for, for clemency, um, Bismarck had to do something to ban public meetings. There was so much outrage because in Germany, a lot of the labor leaders, as I mentioned to you here in America were German, and they were really outraged. They were protesting that these workers who had done nothing but work for their protests for their rights had been given death sentences to be hung. And uh, the day before the execution, there was so much pressure. The governor yielded and he commuted the sentences to life imprisonment for two of the uh, Haymarket martyrs, uh, Felden and Schwab. However, Parsons, Engels, Spies, Fisher, they died on the gallows. And uh, on November 11th, Leon killed himself. Uh, he didn't want to be hung. And Spies' last words have become famous. There will come a time when our silence will be more powerful than the voices you strangled today. Anyway, the funeral attracted thousands of workers to Waldheim Cemetery. Would you believe that that was the only cemetery that, that would allow them to be buried there? All the cemeteries said, no, we don't want these, these revolutionaries in our, in our cemetery. And you may have seen the monument. It has a sculpture of a woman placing a laurel wreath uh, on the below of a, on a worker's head. Um, you should see it if you don't. Look for the uh, monument at the uh, Waldheim Cemetery for the Haymarket Martyrs. Well, this sparked protests. Large delegations of uh, workers around the world were sent from all over the world to attend the funeral. They placed flowers on the monument. Uh, 8,000 workers attended, and they would have been more, but they could, that's all they could, the 
cemetery could hold. And one day after the dedication of the monument, Governor Atwalt issued a famous pardon statement, said, you know, I looked over the trial and I think these men were totally innocent. I think they were victims of a packed jury and a prejudiced judge. I think the trial was unfair. And the excerpt from his message is actually inscribed on the monument. And uh, that uh, the greatest tribute to the memory is that Haymarket was not forgotten. The Haymarket martyrs have become a symbol of the May Day around the world and it didn't stop the eight day protest. In fact, it strengthened it. So the movement to honor these men became the inspiration for the international workers and it created the day to honor them and all working people who fought for their rights. And that's something most Americans don't know. They don't know these days. And express that instead, when you suppress a movement, sometimes you can actually strengthen it down the road. Now, 40,000 carpenters were able to achieve the eight hour day and thousands of other workers in the building trades benefited from all the agitation. Locals were formed all over the country. The membership in unions actually grew rather than being suppressed because they were so outraged at the way the workers were treated. And more strikes were initiated on May 1st than any other single day in the history of the United States. And demonstrations were held on every May 1st to honor what had happened all over the world, not just in America. Even in Australia, they got news that this had happened and there was a huge sympathy strike, can you imagine? And while the immediate effect to achieve the eight hour day was not successful um, and labor continued to be repressed, it began to have an opposite effect and it created a holiday around the world that increased labor's fighting spirit. Samuel Gompers, who was head of the AFL at the time said, May Day will be celebrated as a new independence day for workers. Every year, it will strike a blow for emancipation. It will steadily wink at the shackles of a wage slavery. And all over Europe, especially where? In Germany. Workers took part in meetings, demonstrations, developed marches. Even though they prohibited the meetings, they, they just developed the marches. Uh, it took, however, till 1904 for the Second International to declare May Day a holiday. They suggested workers go on work stoppage on that day to honor all the working people of the world. And uh, one of the greatest uh, demonstrations was held by Lenin in St. Petersburg in uh, May of 1914. And it's because of this radical history in this country that there has been the effort to suppress the real true history of May Day. Uh, it didn't stop it. It began work, the capitalists began to encourage uh, that people should celebrate Labor Day in September when it had no particular radical history attached to it that could radicalize them. It should be noted that the leadership of the AFL, American Federation of Labor, unfortunately was intimidated by this repression. Uh, they recommended that workers not demonstrate, that they should have discussions and not celebrate. They thought by being conservative, by being responsible labor leaders, that they would stop the repression of the struggle and that the bosses would be very sympathetic and thankful and then therefore just give them their rights. Um, well, that didn't work. So, um, in a uh, they thought they didn't even refer to May Day. They suggested that people not mention the word May Day, which is why many workers don't know anything about May Day, because they thought it would encourage repression. They said, just celebrate quietly Labor Day, have a picnic, you know. Anyway, uh, they thought that if they were more responsible, it would stop the repression, which of course it didn't. And, um, you know, that uh, May Day is celebrated still around the world in remembrance of the Haymarket uh, martyrs and, and in uh, deference to the contribution of all working people of the world. Um, the May Day history uh, was celebrated here in marches until the 1950s when Jerry McCarthyism put pressure on the unions to disown it. And in order to show loyalty, the, the AFL said, oh, we should have instead loyalty day. Oh, that would show that we're very loyal. <laughs> and uh, they said, it, 
This was back in 1928. No, 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 we're not going to celebrate May Day. Don't worry about us. And um, so they said, no, no, we're not going to do it. We're going to have a child health day. Has anyone heard of child health day? It was a total failure. Never became popular. Nobody even knows about child health day. Can you imagine how the workers felt when their own labor leaders were unwilling to lead them? I mean, how, how what a betrayal that is. Well, anyway, they were May Day parades nonetheless, especially they were pretty, pretty large during the depression and even during the forties. It wasn't until the McCarthyism period in 1953 that they started to feel that they, the powers that be felt that they could ban May Day parades. They said uh, they were, they were gonna just have, uh, take away their permission to march. And they said, if you wanna do anything, uh, you could just stand there in, in Union Square with a few people, not too many. And I, I, you know, I think workers didn't even really know their history. They didn't even know that there had been marches of huge size, you know. And um, in Boston in 1985, it should be known that Representative John Conyers came and introduced what was um, called the Work Week Bill. It was on the very eve of May Day that he chose to do it. And he asked for the prohibition of forced overtime. He asked for an increase in pay for time and time and a half for overtime. And it's ironic that May Day is this big, enormous holiday. In some countries, they have a few days off, not just May Day, to celebrate workers' holidays, but it's ignored in, in the very country that began it. But who knows what the future holds, who knows? Now in Jamaica Plain, there is a festival called Wake Up the Earth. It's not May Day, but participants come through the streets and they culminate in a festival in the Stony Brook Park. And it celebrates with indigenous people, um, the creative and progressive spirit of our city and our country, and um, the progressive spirit of the people of Boston, especially in Jamaica Plain. And there have been other marches of working people and immigrant workers in Boston. And it's also a May Day is now celebrated by a lot of immigrant workers, if you'll notice. And that's not all here, but all over the country. And though the history is not well known, it's a major holiday all celebrated throughout the world. And one day, let's hope it will be celebrated here. Thank you. Dean, may I say something? Thank you, Judith. Um, are we going to see the, um, uh, the images now? Yes. Yes, but I think somebody wanted to say something. Yeah, thank you so much for that really beautiful and informative speech. Um, a couple of things I just wanted to add. August August Spies um, <clears throat> was the, uh, the uh, is mentioned in in the uh, uh, Haymarket song that uh, was sung as part of the Emma Goldman uh, musical portrait that we did at at, in, at the community church back in '89 and everywhere. Emma Goldman and Elizabeth Gurley Flynn wanted to be and are buried next to the Haymarket Martyrs in Chicago. You can visit their graves when you see that wonderful monument. Um, and uh, Howard Fast's novel, The American, which was my social studies teacher's favorite novel, uh, <laughs> is about John Peter Altgeld uh, and the persecution that he endured for having done the right thing in pardoning the, uh, the martyrs and the, and the, the survivors. Um, also, you, you, you said that May Day uh, has not been uh, uh, honored in this country. Well, not very much, but uh, uh, 50 years ago, 1971, there was a tremendous anti-war demonstration on May Day at the Pentagon. Uh, Portside has been running articles about it. It's quite, quite interesting. Actually, uh, thank you. I want to ask you a question yeah. that maybe you know the answer to, but maybe not, because I don't know that anybody knows the answer to it, except the late Paul Average hint hinted that he might know the answer. Who threw the bomb on May 4th, 1886? What did he say? He said he was working on it, and he, 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 <laughs> thought, he thought he might have some clues, but he never came to any co uh, definite conclusion, as well, I recall. it certainly wasn't proven that the workers did it. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. And uh, It may remain a mystery forever. And who knows, maybe it should stay that way. <laughs> who, 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 who said that? I, I need the uh, gallery review. Me. <laughs> Dave? Dave. Dave Woodruff. Okay. Oh, oh, no, right. You're, you're not on the camera. That's why I didn't see you. Okay. Um, well. 
Thank Should, you. Let's say we, we hear uh, one last song from David Rovix. Oh, we also have to we show them go yours. into the, the images. Yeah. Um, and, and that we also uh, show this beautiful collection basket I love it. Uh, into which I put a, uh, a, a check of my own and, and encourage you to do the same symbolically, virtually, uh, through the U.S. Postal Service, as well as through our website, which yeah. allows you to donate by credit card or by PayPal. And I want to especially mention uh, several people. I won't mention my name uh, because I don't have the list who uh, who um, have have signed up to make regular payments uh, by credit card. And uh, we just so appreciate you all of you. You know who you are. So. There we go. David Rovix, thank you for joining us on this May Day International Workers uh, Day. Oh, it is it is such a pleasure. And I just have to say that um, I was I, I I that was absolutely, absolutely fascinating and 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 so informative. And I thought that I knew uh, everything that you were going to be talking about, Judith. And and I I I, I I'm just like I, I wish. That was a fantastic and very and extremely informative uh, presentation for somebody who's been studying labor history for, for decades. I learned a bunch of new stuff in there, and um, and and I and I feel very and I feel I feel very sad to admit that I only listened to your your presentation because I was participating this morning because I really would have I could, I'd re recommended that to anybody who who wants a background on, on this labor history which is just well it'll be on tape and, and, you, and I'll, I'll get you the link okay yeah yeah I'll tell people to go to it for sure but um and I wish I I had the eight hour uh, day song off the top of my head but I I don't uh, I'll just do this one. This is a more modern rendition. I love I love old labor songs, and I know a lot of them. But I'm gonna I'll just uh, I'll just do this one. We gotta. And incidentally, uh, 5 p.m. Pacific today, 8 p.m. Eastern uh, on the Mayworks. I think Mayworks website, Win Winnipeg Mayworks is putting on a, a, an event, a commemoration of uh, Anne Feeney with me and Maria Dunn and Joe Jenks and Red Moon Rising. And uh, Mayworks, I can't remember. I get Winnipeg Mayworks, if you search for it, it should be clear where that's happening. It's Facebook or something. Uh, here's a song I wrote a couple years ago, which some people claim is now a labor classic. I don't know. It's not for me to decide. But it's the first labor song that mentions computer programmers that I know of. And that definitely needed to happen. You know, I can't leave them out of the whole thing. Gather around all you workers, whether you have a job or not. You who pick the tomatoes, you who grow the pot. You who stay home to raise the children You that record the sound You who flip the burgers All you workers gather round Gather round All you workers All of you who pull the shots You who wash the dishes Park the cars in parking lots who dig the ditches to put the caskets in the ground. You who clean the bathrooms, all you workers gather round. Gather round, and all you workers, all of you who write the code. the children, you who pave the roads, you who run the freight trains wherever they be bound, you who drive the buses, all you workers, gather round, gather round, 
all you workers struggling to pay the rent. You who work a second job and wonder where all the time went. You there in the sleeping bag, shivering on the ground, in the houses, on the sidewalks, all you workers gather round. Gather round, all you workers, all you actors on the street, who point the cameras and write for the magazines. You who launch the missiles, you who fire from the ground, you who fly the helicopters, all you workers gather round. Gather round, all you workers, gather round, you will know that gathered all together, we can vanquish any foe. As sure as we're made of water, so history has found. The workers have the power if all we workers gather round. Oh, and I just want to add the most uh, geeky little uh, thing here. But if if anybody also, while we're while we're asking really geeky questions about who fired that shot in eighteen eighty six, Leonard, I want to also uh, know um, something. If anybody can tell me this, I I have been to the Haymarket uh, to the to the uh, cemetery in uh, West Chicago, and it's an amazing place to visit. I highly recommend it. Uh, and one of the things you'll see at the um, uh, the, at the tombs of the of uh, of the Haymarket martyrs is that quote from August Spies, and in that quote, uh, it is it, it, the quote basically, um, it, it, you know, that the the voices they are strangling, right? And and they talk. He talks about the voices they're strangling today. But uh, but it's unclear to me anyway whether he made the speech in German or in English because in, Pro in German probably German they, because there are so many German? versions in English and he probably made it in German on May fourth, nineteen eighty six, we celebrated the centennial of the Haymarket in Germany with uh, the the, po the original posters and they were in English and in German and uh, that was the first performance of E.G. a musical portrait of Emma Goldman which has now had, uh, you know, 50 productions in five countries. That was the beginning. It was 35 years ago, exactly yesterday. Okay, great. Got an answer to that question. I'm going to write a song with the chorus being uh, his speech, but I wanted to see if he really gave it in German or not, because I thought it really belongs in German and uh, that yes. the, the chorus belongs in German. But I didn't want to just like make it up that shit. You know, that's, uh, that seemed very wrong. <laughs> okay. Thanks, guys. It's been such a pleasure to participate. So... Judith, do we have those those beautiful posters? Unmute. You must unmute. You must unmute, Judith. There. Oh, there okay, go. I said we do have them, and people can see them in person next year at the hopefully at the Stony Brook Park in Jamaica Plain opposite the, the, the Stony Brook State Tea Station. Can you see the first slide? Not yet. H have uh, you shared the screen? Oh, okay, let me do that. Uh, share, share, share. Up. Uh, zoom, zoom, zoom. There we are. Uh, share screen. There we go. learning more every day. Can you see it now? Yes. Good, let me improve it. These were all made by uh, artists and also community residents of Greater Boston. And um, they will hopefully be on exhibit at the Wake Up the Earth Festival next year. Many were done by, a few were done by young, very young people. Ethan, I'm trying to get to a, place behind this, uh, let, me do it. let me do it this way, hold on. We'll be with you in a sec. 
There we go. Okay, there. Can you see that? Yes. Good. Fills, fills the whole screen. Perfect. Excellent. All right. So what do I do next? We press these buttons. Okay. Go there. So May Day is one of the world's oldest holidays. Oh, explain that. Um, which is celebrated system. internationally. It is a day to wake up the earth and shake up the system. The um, murals that you see were made um, by people, uh, both uh, professional artists and usually non-professionals. Uh, artists and they're on board. They're four by four feet by eight feet. Um, they were thought about originally this holiday started by Femke Rosenbaum, who also created the Lantern Parade and other festivals, Tropical Fiesta. And uh, I hope that we will be able to resume next year. Anyway, um, so that's one of the first ones. And here's another one. And uh, it's the winter was over, the spring became, and it says, and renewed the earth once again. So, and uh, this is on the origins of the festival. May Day and the Maypole date back to prehistoric times for the celebration of the change of seasons. And over time, the Maypole is used as a celebratory um, season uh, to show the seasons. And of course, by the way, the first one was here uh, in the uh, Massachusetts, Boston area, Quincy, and it was suppressed. Uh, well, that's another story. Okay, many cultures had myths about Mother Earth who was responsible for creation. And again, these are murals made by artists and non-professionals, community residents. Women's ability to create new life gave rise to many creation myths around the world. And so, it, Africa and Asia, many people celebrated the spirit of creation with the annual, the annual return and renewal of vegetation. And they, some places they did this in May, which is very appropriate. And uh, they named it after Maya, the mother of all gods, according to the Greek myths. And in ancient times, spring was celebrated by fertility rites. Um, people went into the woods and sometimes as couples, and they went what they was called a maying. And uh, that was very popular, let me tell you. A child's interpretation of the arrival of spring. Um, you can't maybe read this, so I'm gonna read it to you. May Day was a holiday where no one worked for a number of days, and it was attacked by authorities because the growing industrial revolution was trying to have a Puritan work ethic and maypoles, dancing, games, they were outlawed as early as uh, 1550. And when the um, English came to America, they celebrated May Day and they celebrated, by the way, with indigenous people. Uh, they put a uh, deer skull on top of the maypole and both um, uh, native women going bare-breasted as was the custom in warm days. And along uh, came, by the way, Miles Standish and saw it and flipped out. <laughs> and sent Thomas Morton back to England. He returned. They sent him back again, by the way, sent back twice. Anyway, all the maypoles were banned and the people protested. They named the day after Robin Hood made Marion. They made a big May Day feast. They said it was ruled by the Lord of Misrule. And they declared on May Day, the rich would be the poor, the poor would be the rich. And guess what? The land would be redistributed. Wait a minute, so wasn't that it took Maid on Marian? May Marion or Maid Marion? Maid Marion, M-A-I-D. But here it says May Marion. Oh, sorry. Oh, well, we typo. Typo. It's on, it's so, on, no, it's not your error. It's, 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 it's in the writing there. It says May well, Marion. Yeah, well, I this, know, but it's wrong. a young person or something. Yes, but it's wrong. Maybe it's an, an intentional uh, slip or something. Who knows? Okay, could be. This take on greater significance because there was a lot of attack on the common lands. They were being privatized, cut up. They originally belonged to people. People could go out and hunt on the land and not have to worry about it. They could fish on the land and keep the fish. It didn't belong to anyone. The fish whoever, was whoever caught it. The deer was whoever shot it. But instead, people began dividing up the land, privatizing it, and saying that they owned it. And those who used to live free were now evicted. They could no longer support themselves. And guess what? That was very useful because they were forced into working for wages in the fields and in the factories. And so the celebration of Mother Earth took on a double meaning. It was also a protest. 
So when the pilgrims came to America, there were many indentured servants who had been freed from jail on the condition that they would be willing to go on the ships to colonize in the name of England. And of course, it was a very dangerous trip. And they had been, the people, if many of them had been jailed for celebrating May Day and the movement for a common land. So when they came, rather than try to convert the Indians, they noticed the Indians had come in land. They were very attracted to the Indians and they joined them. So one of the celebrants was Thomas Morton and he came to Massachusetts quite early, 1626. He settled here in Quincy and he named land Marymount. So on May Day in 1627, he and his friends, he had many friends with the Indians, he liked their way of life and uh, he was fraternized with them and really enjoyed them, lived with them. He erected a huge maypole, may, may they wrapped it in ribbons, topped with deer antlers that the Indians suggested. And Englishmen and Indian women danced together. And I should mention that one of the things that set Miles Standish and the Puritans off is that the women, it was a hot day and the women were bare-breasted. So they were like, oh my God. So Morton they had said, no, these Indians, these, these Indians are equal to us. We have to learn from them. And he armed, he did something what the English hated. He armed the Indians against the English. So the Puritans burned down the settlements of Morton, uh, Thomas Morton. They sent him back to England and they sent all the other settlers of Marymount back to England. They said, we don't want that. We don't want that kind of celebration here. And so the first May Day in America was forgotten. It wasn't celebrated again for 200 years. However, when the mechanization of the land happened, working conditions got much worse. And then relative surplus value could only be increased by raising the cost of food. And this caused a lot of disturbances, of course. And food was being produced first by slaves and then sharecroppers. And this involved labor. So well, there was a social reformer, you probably have heard of him, Robert Owen, he chose May Day to become the people's new millennium because it was associated with the people's struggle for the earth and the quality. And it was for this reason that the labor movement chose May Day to be the struggle for the eight hour day. We owe that to the reformer, Robert Owen. Abraham Lincoln, however, said, the strongest bond of human sympathy outside a family relation should be the one uniting all working people of all nations, tongues and kindreds. So the history of the modern May Day started in 1886, as I had mentioned to you in my talk, when the Federation of Organized Trade Union uh, Unions resolved, eight hours will constitute a legal day's work. The Haymarket protest occurred on May 4th when a late prote labor protest rally near Chicago's Haymarket Square turned into a riot after someone threw a bomb at the police or the police threw the bomb, who knows what happened, but eight people died and as a result of violence that day. So May 1st was chosen to be International Workers' Day to commemorate the Haymarket Affair in Chicago in support of the eight hour day. At the demonstration, the police killed one worker, injured several others, 70 others, by the way. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but the pictures are there of the Haymarket martyrs uh, over there. So when workers out West heard about all these things, they put not stimulated by it. And they also wanted to work for better wages, battled for it. And the civil war broke out in the Rocky Mountains. And uh, around the early 1900s, I think the teens, 1919, Joe Hill, a labor leader, Swede from Sweden originally, was framed for murder and he was successfully executed. Eugene Debs, the great socialist leader said, May Day belongs to the working class. It's dedicated to the revolution. The, uh, Lex Lexing, the Lawrence textile strike, better known as the bread and roses strike, was a strike of immigrant workers in Lawrence in Massachusetts. And it uh, was in 1912 led by the IWW, the industrial workers of the world. It was prompted by a two hour pay cut. Uh, they wanted to shorten the work week. And so they thought, okay, well, let's cut the wages then. So the strike spread uh, rapidly through the town and it grew to more than 20,000 workers involving every mill, every mine, every mill in Lawrence. And uh, you may have heard the song, 
as we go marching, marching in the beauty of the day. A million darkened kitchens, a thousand mills lost gray, are touched with all the radiance that a sudden sun discloses. For the people here are singing, bread and roses, bread and roses. Maybe at the end of this talk, someone will sing this song. Anyway, May Day, 1919. There were 150 workers imprisoned in the Fort Leavenworth prison. And in commemoration of May Day, they stopped their assigned work in the middle of the day. And this action triggered a sympathy strike and 2000 people stopped working in sympathy with the workers at Leavenworth. Anyway, this is a, a beautiful portrait of Sacco and Vanzetti who were two Italian immigrants, Im uh, immigrants advocates who had come to the United States in 1908. One was a shoemaker and the other was a fish peddler. They were arrested for the crime of murder. And on May 31st, 1921, they were brought before Judge Webster Thayer of Massachusetts Supreme, uh, Superior Court. On July 14th, they were found guilty. They were executed a number of years later. They weren't executed right away because there was worldwide protest. And it kept, it was so large, he couldn't do it. But finally, in 1927, he did. And it was Governor Dukakis of our state who proclaimed their exoneration. So that's something to be proud of. Uh, this shows workers sharing the fruits of their labor. And uh, this says, protect the rights of children and workers. And there was a lot of child labor and there was a lot of protests against child labor asking that a minimum age be set for when children, when people could work, not eight year olds, not 10 year olds, especially as fingers were cut off, children were not given sunshine and sunlight or education. The whole fight against for, for better working conditions, for better salaries, radicalized workers. And charted by the National AFL, right here in Boston, the Labor Council is working even today to improve the lives of working families within a 24 communities in the jurisdiction. And the goal is to build a movement of unions and workers to advocate for working family issues uh, in the town halls and cities of Greater Boston. And it's still active now. And the Greater Boston Labor Council is wants to reach out to its progressive allies within all the communities and form coalitions to advance the cause of economic justice. And I don't know if you could read it, but there's a list of the different towns within Massachusetts that belong to the Greater Boston Labor Council. And uh, that's very exciting. So the SEIU Local 285 works to see that there are public services available for everyone. And uh, everyone wins, it says, when public services win. Who did this poster? That's uh, my union. Yes, well, good. it's a good fighting union. And they have a janitor's union. And this one says, justice for janitors. Stand up for the American dream. We can do it. And say you also represents medical workers and medical workers are working for you. Help make your community better by joining the union. And this is local 26. It's the hotel and restaurant workers union. And it says hotel employees want justice, never surrender. So SEIU local 509, they represent 20,000 human service workers and educators throughout all of Massachusetts. And they provide social services to elders at risk children and people with mental illnesses or de developmental disabilities. And also educational services in public and private sectors. From mental health clinicians to social workers to early childhood educators, they even university lecturers Local 509 are un members are united in their mission to raise living standards for working families and improve the quality and affordability of the services that they provide. And it says, strongly up together, an injury to one is an injury to all. Organize, educate, agitate. And this one is the introduction to some of the green ideas. Kids. And uh, children did this, they made a collage and pasted their pictures on this board. And um, of course the prairies are green in May and 
the virgin and dark brown crumbling shot with fine sand is the years of uh, humus and organic decomposition. The earth was husbanded by the Native Americans of the plains. Black Ale told their story, and it's the story of all life. All life is holy, it's good to tell, and two-legged should share with four-legged, and should share with the wings of the air and all green things, because these are the spirit, these are the children of one mother, and their father is one spirit. And uh, this was made by a child. <coughs> and uh, this says complexity of dream <coughs> issues. The, the, limbs have, me? the limbs have sayings. The limbs have different sayings. It's hard to read them. Uh, decentralization, economics, cultural sustainable forces and focus and sustainability. Uh, personal global response, democracy, respect for it diversity, et cetera. Nice. And this one shows the hazards of pesticides for farm workers. That's a very big issue, right to this very day. Um, I don't know, some of us who are older may remember Julia Butterfly Hill. She um, <clears throat> went up in a tree and it was took two years before she came down from that tree. And she was called Luna. And she went into a thousand year old uh, redwood tree and stayed up there. People brought up food to her. I don't know how she went to the bathroom, but she did. And she climbed up 180 feet into the tree that was on top of a mountain. And um, she thought it would only be two or three weeks tree sit, but she stayed there for two years and she was supported by the people who followed her protest. Also, there was another uh, person who was involved in that protest of environmental activist named David Gypsy Train. He was 24 years old and he was protesting against the logging of beautiful and treasured um, redwood trees. Unfortunately, he was killed by a falling tree that was intentionally chopped down to hurt him by a logger. And despite evidence that the logger had threatened to kill him and kill protesters, the district attorney didn't press any charges of murder. In fact, he dismissed the whole case. Uh, many of you who are old enough remember Anne Berlick Timpson. She was a friend of our family, by the way. So she was called the Red Flame of Lowell, and she was an early U.S. labor union organizer. By the way, if you go to the uh, museum in, uh, where is it, Woonsocket? Woonsocket. It, there's a museum that's dedicated to the history of labor, and there's a whole part dedicated to our Massachusetts uh, uh, wonderful organizer, Anne Burlock Timpson. I think she used to attend community church, by the way. And she was born in 1911 in uh, Pennsylvania, Slattington. And she was the daughter of labor organizers, Harry, Harry and Anastasia of Smegel Berlick. They came to the United States as immigrants from Tsarist Russia. And she was a force to be reckoned with, anyone who knows her and remembers her contribution, the rain flame of Lowell. And um, now there's a big struggle for the legalization of undocumented workers, which is what this mural shows. And uh, this also shows the poor down at the bottom and the big fat rich on top, as the artist portrays it. And uh, this beautiful poster was done by David Fichter. And it says the Massachusetts Jobs for Justice is a coalition of community faith and labor groups in Massachusetts, organizing for working people, allies to fight for the rights of all workers locally, nationally, internationally. Still and it's still such a, still, still a, that's a still struggle we all have to continue to participate in. But these are beautiful working uh, posters uh, or actually placards there, four feet by eight feet on wooden board. Now, some of you may remember Nell Alpern, that's her. She's been painted right in the middle of this Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, which he was very involved in, which I had the privilege to know Nell quite personally and was involved in the WILF too. And it came into being as a protest against the war in 1919 at the end of World War I, when people could see what all the destruction that the war had brought. And it evolved from a women's peace party, a pacifist organization organized by Jane Addams and others who attended the International Congress of Women at The Hague in April, 1915. And while they talk a lot about women's rights, 
I don't think many people know that Jane Addams was also a pacifist and against war and a war anti-war activist. Anyway, in 1999, many of you may remember the Seattle uh, WTO protests referred to the Battle of Seattle. And they were a series of protests surrounding the World Trade Organization's ministerial conference that took place in 1999, when members of the World Trade Organization when we're able to convene at the Washington State Convention in the state of Washington, Seattle, Washington, on November 30th. And that conference launched the beginning of a new millennial of more fair and just trade negotiations to protect the rights of workers. And this says a good slogan, people, not profits. And this is the last slide. It's the People Organized May Day. Rent control, May Day's international workers, education, democratic fertilization, no silent spring, make love, not war. Art has no borders, fight racism. Isn't that a gorgeous poster? I think it's, it's, a, it's a board. It should be made into a poster. I'd love it to see that. It's made into a poster and it is on a sandwich board in front of Community Church in Copley Square. Well, that's where it deserves to be. Bravo for you, Dean. All right. I, I didn't want to identify all the artists, but since it's the last slide, I will say that this was made by Roberto Chow, who at the time lived in Jamaica Plain, has often moved, lived in Uruguay, he was from Uruguay, but a very talented and community activist artist. Anyway, I think it's a great pic last picture. Thank you all for the chance to That's show these question. beautiful work. Thank you. Does anyone have some questions? Thank you, Judith. This is so rich and it's been such a great program. Let's, uh, it's, we're on one o'clock, but let's quick scroll through everybody who's here, uh, like uh, Ken and like Homer and like Leonard and Charlie and Jim Casteris from up in, oh, out in Wellesley now and, and Rudiger, Virginia, Mary Lynn. Thank you all for being here, Barry. Oh, and Ed. Pat and Ed, who is behind me. Yeah. Alvin, Carolyn, who is also in the room here on a different computer, and Alan Clemens. Thank you all. If there's anything, any final observation anybody wants to make or question for Judith. Judith, uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, exhibition. Now, that's it, these are murals that are, are to be seen in Jamaica Plain now? or it's, No. They are only shown on Wake Up the Earth, the first Saturday Story. in May. They're in storage at the spontaneous celebrations. There's no room to put them up, oh. but they are able to be seen if you come to the May Day celebration in Jamaica Plain, Stony Pond Park. They're all put up around the park. Every, every May Day. Every May, well, May Day, yes, if the first, um, the first, first Saturday, Saturday of May. May. But that is as just close to May first as you can get. That is just beautiful, and, and maybe the, 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 somehow you could post. Uh, uh, a slideshow of them online that people could watch? Well, they, you know, that's an interesting this idea. YouTube, this YouTube will be available online. So there you have it. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm able to send it to my we children. We could also yeah. maybe just display it as, as a slideshow on our YouTube channel as well. I think that's reasonable because I'm giving the talk at Community Church. Yes, they will be within this YouTube presentation of this of this Sunday morning, but also we could maybe do it, do it as just a... Uh, well, yeah, also... I, I think that would be a good idea if people just want to see the slideshow, it, it would be possible. But I also think that if you want to see them in person, which is wonderful, come to and follow the Wake Up the Earth Festival in Jamaica Plain, the first Saturday of May. It hasn't happened for the last year. year because of COVID or this year, but let's hope that next year we can all assemble and uh, greet the May Day in the uh, Stony Brook Park and look at these murals in person and hear the marchers and join the march, by the way. Yeah. There is a march, starts at the monument in Jamaica Plain. There's a big monument and uh, you can start right there. What avenue is that called? What street? Center. On Center Street, right on Center Street. There's a monument, keep going till you find a big monument and stand there and you will be joined by people ready to celebrate May Day with you. Judith, um, I want to thank you and Dave for putting together the PowerPoint. 
Leonard, thank you for all your contributions. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's announcements uh, in the chat about several things going on. David Rovix has already uh, signed out. He had to uh, go elsewhere. But he, tonight, it's called Winnipeg Mayworks, 8 PM. You can look that up, Winnipeg Mayworks. There's a bunch of great people, Joe Jenks, Maria Dunn, um, a tribute to Ann Feeney. Um, no. Again, Judith, this program will be available on YouTube as soon as I can. Judith, you asked for bread and roses. I posted in the chat a link to the uh, Solidarity Singers of the New, Just New Jersey Industrial Union and the Metropolitan Philharmonic Chorus singing that at the American Labor Museum in uh, New Jersey. Oh, that's wonderful. That's Thank wonderful. You. Maybe, Dean, you could sing it. You, do you know it? Um, as we come marching, marching. Not only do I know it, but I will put up, if I can find it, uh, lyrics. <laughs> okay, that's, that's wonderful. Maybe we could sing it with you. There? Okay. Hey. In our own homes, we Everybody, could sing it with you. Uh, uh, Charlie, if you will uh, unmute. <laughs> it, it doesn't work to sing together on Zoom. Together is very hard on Zoom. As All right, then you sing it. Marching, marching in the beauty of the day. A million darkened kitchens, a thousand mill lofts gray, are touched with all the radiance that a sudden sun discloses. For the people here are singing bread and roses, bread and roses. As we go marching, marching, we battle to four men. For they are women's children, and we mother them again. Our lives shall not be sweated from birth until life closes. Hearts starve as well as bodies. Give us bread, but give us roses. As we go marching, marching, unnumbered women dead go crying through our singing their ancient call for bread. Smart art and love and beauty, their drudging spirits knew. Yes, it is bread we fight for, but we, we fight, fight for roses too. Thank you, everybody. Happy May Day. <laughs> Happy May Day. We'll see you next week. We have a bunch of great programs coming up all the way into the month of June. Enjoy this springtime, okay. this summer. Okay. Dean, Dean, Dean uh, put that link to the uh, concert in the in the chat. Or it, it already is. Winnipeg Mayworks, eight p.m. tonight. There's a link to our concert on May fourth. Also, it. link to and, uh, Judith. So, uh, Bread and Roses was the tune that we used uh, to do a tribute to uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg when she died. We, there's also a, a song on, or you can find that uh, tribute to Ruth Bader Ginsburg to the tune of Bread and Roses. Oh, beautiful. Thank you for telling me that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, David Rovix. Thank Leonard. you, Dean. Thank Judith, you, Dean. Dave. 